Okay, well, hey, everybody, welcome. My name is Bryce Hansen. I'm with the Small Business Development Center based out of Sandy, Utah. We've been around for over 40 years. Uh, one of 63 networks nationwide, that, that's the SBDC networks uh, in the U.S., as well as in some of the territories of the United States. And we love to work with you as entrepreneurs. We meet with people one-on-one -on -one as business advisors, and we also host or um, teach different uh, courses throughout the year, really based on the functional areas of business or things that are relevant to your business. And uh, currently, we are we have a, a an artificial intelligence or AI uh, seminar series where we we invite experts in the AI field in various angles. And right now, AI is quite um, quite a wild west. There's a lot of applications coming out. You know, uh, different uh, different ways to apply AI to businesses, well, to life really, but to business, to marketing. So there's really cool things going on, and so uh, we we're, we're 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 stoked to have Matt Sheehan with us, uh, with General with Gen AI Marketers, and so they're they're playing in this field and doing some good some cool things, and so because there's so much going on, you know, not every one person has uh, a corner on the knowledge. There's so much going on, so we we're just bringing people who are who know more about it or her working with this technology and applying it. And we're just, uh, we're just happy to be able to learn from, from them. And Matt is one of those people working in this area and just creating some cool things. So uh, Matt's background, he's been in marketing uh, for, for a number of years and uh, has done some good, good stuff and he has some an interesting background thing. He's things he's working on right now. And he'll, he'll introduce uh, some of that right uh, in a, in a second. Um, and so we're, we're, we're pleased to, to do that. Just a little bit about, um, again, the SBDC um, and, and myself, uh, I, worked, I work as an advisor at the Sandy SBDC. I worked in small with small businesses for 15 years and in, in the technology uh, with the commercialization of technology, as well as just uh, different, different uh, just normal uh, run of the mill businesses. So um, but without further ado, we're going to go ahead and, oh, and by the way, if you have any questions in the audience, just feel free, you know, go ahead and, and type in the chat box or the Q&A box, your question, and I can jump in and ask a question. I think, um, I think we may have, a, you know, quite a few, a lot of people. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say just, just uh, jump in with the questions vocally, but um, how do you feel about that, Matt? What, what's your thoughts? That's fine. Yeah, I mean, okay. feel free to stop me as I go through. I'm I'm good with that. Well, we can okay. leave it to the end, whatever people want to do. But yeah, I'm, I'm okay. more than happy people jumping in. Okay, so if you do that, you guys, just what I ask is, uh, you know, uh, just when, when you ask a question, you know, please just quickly mute yourself after so we just don't get any cross cross talk from, you know, something that's happening in your, your house, your office, so we can kind of keep, keep the cross talk uh, or the noise kind of keep that down. That'd be great. All right, so we'll just go ahead and jump in. Matt, go go ahead and introduce a little bit more about yourself, and we look forward to this presentation today. Yeah, happy to do that. Just one thing. Can you see my screen now, Bryce? Am I sharing my yes, screen? Yes, I, okay. yes, I, I can see it. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, well, th thanks, Bryce. Nice introduction. Um, I uh, Well, for people who first pick up, I've got a funny accent, so it's not an Australian accent. It's a British accent, so I came here in the, the 90s. Um, I actually came to ski in Park City and I thought, do I really want to go back to that rainy, little rainy country or do I want to stay around, stick around here? So uh, I didn't bother going back. So <laughs> and that was a long time ago. So people think I've just come off the boat, but I've still got a strong accent. I can't mimic your accent. Car is doesn't sound right. So anyway, so I'm a Brit. I actually came over here in the 90s and I wasn't technical. Then. I'm actually a geographer and I, I bumped into this thing called the web or the, the World Wide Web. And I thought this is going to completely change our world. And uh, so that really started my journey into what I've been doing for the last 30 years, which is really sitting between technology sort of and business applications. Um, and that's really what this talk is going to be much about. I mean, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and the impact it's potentially going to have on our world, which I think is going to be profound. As Bryce said, I work for an, an organization called Gen AI Marketers. I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end, what we actually do. But um that's what I do. So my focus is is 100% on, on in the world of AI. Um, 
I was thinking how best to structure this presentation. I've actually got a slightly different title on the screen to what you guys were presented with. I taken kind of a step back. We are going to be talking a lot about marketing, but marketing is going to be our use case, if you like. I think the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence and generative AI, which is going to be our focus, is very broad. So I'm going to sort of go from sort of 800 feet and then drill down from there in this presentation, which is why I've called this generative AI leveling the playing field for small and medium sized businesses. Those are the, those are the folks I suspect most of you on the call are in those in that sort of arena. That's where I work mostly. Um, a, a couple of other things. I've structured it such that when I first came to America, I was a ski instructor in Park City. And one of the guys there said to me, it's much more important to about what you show than what you say. Uh, and I'll, I'll carry that through in this presentation. Um, I've tried to structure this so there's a lot in every slide. They're not, they're not complicated slides, but there's a lot of information in the slides specifically around generative AI. So when you want to look back on this, on this recording, and, and Bryce said that this is going to be recorded, um, look back on it and take a look at what's in the slides and you don't have to take copious notes on this thing because it's all going to be recorded but uh, I've tried to structure it in a way that's going to be helpful for you guys so my words are less important than what you're looking at so let's jump in um, again if you feel as though you've got questions as I go through um, just let me know so I think we're we're going through this evolution one might call it revolution of technology um, when I as I mentioned when I first came to America um, I bumped into this thing called the World Wide Web. The, um, the U of U was fortunately on the original ARPANET. So it was one of the universities that was connected to the internet. So I got access to this thing called the internet. And I, I went out to the horticultural buildings on, on North Temple and I saw a presentation by some folks in computer science. And they showed a picture, or they, they showed this, this computer that was in Russia at the time and I and I and I was thinking to myself well I don't know much about computers I thought they were these things that sat in big big labs or they sat on people's desks how is this working that we've got this connect I can actually see into the world or into Russia and if I realized that we were about to enter this profound change in the world because we were connecting these complicated things called computers to other computers and coming from England, and I'm a big soccer fan. Anyone that's watching this knows, might know Chelsea in the Premiership. They're, they're my team. So I'd left my family. I'd moved to America. I couldn't get access to soccer. I couldn't get access to anything. And all of a sudden, there were these computers that were connected together. And my head was really, it just threw me. I just thought, this is going to change our world. And so I did a master's degree up at the U, actually. And, and I learned how to be a computer programmer and started writing um, web applications. So that was kind of my journey into it. But so that journey that we've been on in technology, which has been sort of really ramping up, went from laptops and Apple and, the, um, and, 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 uh, and um, Windows and IBM producing these things we could have at home to these connected computers, um, which was the Internet. And again, if anyone's old enough to remember the late 90s, how the, the Internet bubble and all the things that happened, that was a massive change in our world when we managed to have computer connected computers. Um, so that was really, for me, that was the first phase of the revolution. In the late 2000s was the second phase, and that was really the mobile revolution. Um, and for me, that I, I've actually always worked in the sort of geospatial world. So the ge I'm a geographer, so stuff on maps is really what my background is. To me, it meant we've got these computers in our pocket. And in my, my universe, that meant that those computers had GPS on them, so people knew where they were. So the, the need to know, to see a map, to see what was around people was really where my focus was. And I set up a company actually that was developing uh, mobile, com, uh, mobile app, uh, applications. But that's been a massive change in terms of how we access um, the world. So it's gone from ju not just the, the internet, which was this computers connected to these mobile devices in our pockets, which allow us to do the things we can do today. And so, you know, we've kind of, if you, if you ever read about this stuff, the first phase was web one, the second phase was web two, um, which is kind of the mobile world, social media, all those good things. But again, it's been a profound change in our world, the mobile revolution. And now I think we're at the third stage and, and this is artificial intelligence. And, and we can encapsulate that more in some of the other things that are happening. I mean, there's augmented reality and all these other terms that are coming up with Apple producing this Vision Pro where we can actually put this thing on and be in this different world. But with our focus here is, is artificial intelligence. And frankly, 
we don't know where this is going to go to. Um, I think when I was first working on the web, I used to say to people in marketing, do you have a website? And they would always look at me and say, many people I remember said to me, well, we can't afford that. Why would we want to do something like that? That's that sort of thing over there. We don't really understand. Um, you know, how wrong were they? <laughs> it doesn't really matter being wrong. It's just the fact that at that stage, people couldn't visualize what connected computers meant and where it's potentially going to go to. I don't know where AI is going to go to at the minute. I mean, I, I think it was somewhat easy to understand the internet somewhat. Um, mobile, you could kind of conceptualize what that was. Where we're going with AI now is, is really unknown. And we're at a very early stage of this, uh, of this revolution that is the AI revolution. Um, so it's going to be fascinating. There's a lot of fear, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity. And we're going to kind of talk about more of the opportunity in this talk than we are about the fear. I wanted to point out to you on this slide that in a lot of the cases, I've generated what the content is on the slide with different tools, uh, generative AI tools. So you'll see at the bottom of this slide, image generated with DALI 3. Uh, make note of that. DALI 3 is actually within the ChatGPT world. So that's one of the tools that I will be talking about showing you in this talk. So you'll see a lot of references underneath to how it's generated. Take note of that image. Take note of the, um, the text in that image and how poor it is. <laughs> um, so we'll keep moving forward. So that's the evolution of technology. I've got some videos in this, and I'm going to hopefully everything comes across nicely. I always fear when I put videos into presentations if they, they come across, but I'm just going to play this video. So the question here is, what is artificial intelligence? Ever wondered how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning are all connected? Picture this, AI is the big boss, the mastermind behind it all. Machine learning is like its right-hand man, handling the day-to-day -day operations. And deep learning? Well, that's the genius prodigy, diving deep into complex tasks. So, next time you hear these terms, remember, it's all about circles within circles, each playing a vital role in the world of AI. Mind blown, right? <laughs> so, uh, again, this is part of our, our journey in this conversation. I didn't generate any of that. That was not me. I didn't do anything there. I used a tool called Veed.io to generate the whole thing. Um, and we'll talk about prompts in a bit. But I asked Veed.io to create that. So I didn't do anything there. That was just – and, and I, I, when I generated that some little while ago, I was, like, quite surprised by how nice that content is. So – we're not going to dive too deeply in AI. I, I'm not, I, I'm an AI guy, but I'm not, uh, I didn't do a, my, even though my, my degree was uh, part of my time was spending computer science, I'm not a computer scientist, nor am I, a, a, I'm an AI expert from a, a user perspective more than I am from a technical perspective. But we will dive a little bit into AI here. I think the context is important. So if you look at that diagram to the one side, you've got the three circles. So artificial intelligence actually dates back to the 50s, and it's, it's really an umbrella term. It's uh, They call it a discipline. A lot of people in computer science really dislike the term artificial intelligence. And I think it was actually written for somebody who was trying to get a paper published and try to come up with something clever about what the paper was about, and they came up with this term artificial intelligence. So it kind of stuck. So that's really the umbrella term. Machine learning is really where we'll talk more in this conversation um, and we're going to dive deeper into generative AI, which is a subset of machine learning. So what is, what is machine learning? Machine learning is really, what it is, is using data to train algorithms. In the strictest sense, it's to train algorithms. So I, I think that I always try and think of the analogy of the Olympics. You know, you've got people in the Olympics that are specialists in particular areas. You've got 1,500 meter runners. You've got high jumpers. You've got people who do long jump. They train continuously for their discipline. You almost can think of machine learning as those athletes. They're very, very good at particular things, and they train and train and train on those particular things. Um, that's that world. And so um, what we use machine learning for is decisions and predictive, piece, predictive work. So, again, a bunch of machines, you can think of it like a bunch of machines that are really good at doing very specific tasks. Um, You'll hear a term if you ever dive deeper into this called models. And models are really those, they're, they're the experts. They're, they're the ones that have been trained to do that. They're the athletes. So when you come across the term model, they've been trained on data to do something very specific. 
And in the world of machine learning, it's a very broad area. So it's, again, it's not particularly new. It's been around for quite a long time. And it's regression is part of machine learning. So if you've ever, you know, I, I cringe at how poor I was at maths, but I remember doing regression at, to, at college. Um, that's really that world where you've trained machines to do some of this stuff that we would do sort of more manually. So there's a whole world of stuff out there um, that is that falls under the um, machine learning title. And there are really three things to what makes up machine learning. There's the input data, there's the model, and then there's the output. So that really is the, the makeup of everything that sits under machine learning. The, the input data is what's called training data. So that's how we train the athlete, the model, to do what he does. So again, using that analogy, there was a very famous athlete in England called Sebastian Coe, who was a 1,500-meter runner. And his dad was his trainer. His dad gave him all the routines, gave him everything to do. His dad's kind of the training data. His dad got him through these routines, and he, he ran, and he did all these different things to become an expert at 1,500 meters. The end result was he, he won the gold medal uh, in the Olympics multiple times and broke lots of world records. So, again, excuse my crude analogies, but that's kind of the world of machine learning, and that's sort of how that whole world works. There's anyone that dives deeper, you're going to come across supervised and unsupervised data and all sorts of different things about how they train that data, how the output can be very specific. You can identify a dog versus a cat versus classifying a tractor versus a house. So there's a whole world there. And I'm not going to go into that. And again, if you're interested, you can dive deeper into that. Um, but it's important to understand that where we're talking about in this presentation is generative AI. And generative AI falls under deep learning, which is the middle sort of the red circle there. And, and this is where we start talking about neural networks. And again, not going to cover neural networks at all. But when we start thinking about these analogies with the human brain, neural networks are based around the human brain. So you've got neurons and you've got connections through neurons and how our brains learn is kind of how neural networks are modeled. And if AI is built on neural networks, other machine learning algorithms also use neural networks, but generative AI is, is a neural network um, place. Um, if you want to compare the human brain to ChatGPT, ChatGPT has 100 billion connections between its respective neurons. We've got 100 trillion in our brains. So just to give you a sense of, we're really not, I mean, even though it's modeling our brains and people worry about it becoming our brains, becoming, you know, these things becoming like our brains, there's a long way to go before it's ever going to get there. Disregard, I mean, the size of our brains in terms of the net, the new number of neurons and the connections that we've got is absolutely off the charts, incredible. Also, there's other parts of the human brain which is different to how a machine might do it. And we, we've got sort of emotional understanding, all that good stuff. So the fear of, of this stuff becoming um, like our brains is, we're a long way off from that. So I've spent too long on that slide. Let's move on. Oh. I don't want to do that. Okay, uh, generative AI. So what is generative AI? Generative AI is that part of machine learning world which is creating new content. That's the core of it. So it's creating new content. Why is it all of a sudden we've got this big push on talking about generative AI? Well, there's really three things that make that up. The first thing is, that we've got incredible amounts of data now available to us. Um, if you look at ChatGPT, ChatGPT has been trained on all of the data in, on the internet, everything. It's an enormous amount of data. So we now have incredible amounts of data to train these models on, which we didn't have historically. We've also got the processing power, and anyone that's, uh, that's following some of the NVIDIA share price will understand that uh, how important uh, the processing is and these new processes we're generating. So there's a second piece. The third piece is we've got now got experts who are in universities who have been working on this stuff forever. So we've got a whole load of experts now that started to build this stuff. Um, and this is not an insignificant exercise. Uh, the, the money that uh, I've heard some numbers on how much OpenAI have spent on ChatGPT and it's astronomical. You know, so we've got big companies now that have got deep pockets that can build these things. So there's this sort of a perfect storm, if you like, that uh, that we're now in, in the place of. So I've got that image on the screen, which is that was generated by DALI 3 within ChatGPT. And then it was animated with uh, a, 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 
a model, well, Pika Labs is the organization that, that I animated that with. So a combination of, of technologies there came up with what's a very simple image, but it's an animated image. Um, oh, and by the way, I came up with the notion of, of the output as well by a prompt where I said, create an image with this information in it. Um, and again, we'll talk about prompts in a minute. So that's what that, so that's what makes generative AI different because it's generating new content, and that's where all the buzz is. So how? I'll take a quick cup of coffee. Excuse me. So how does generative AI work? So generative AI is made up of multiple different model types. So we've got you'll hear the term large language models which are text-based things. That's that's the, the ones that we hear a lot about. That's, um, again, OpenAI, uh, sorry, ChatGPT is, is one of those. There's others, another one called Claude. There's Morphic. You'll see some references to that in this. So there's a bunch of LLMs that are out there, large language models. They're not the only ones out there. We're now generating imagery. We're now generating video. Um, anyone that saw the announcement from OpenAI on Sora will see what's coming in the video world. Um, we're also generating music. So we're generating a lot of content. There's lots of different models that are focused on this content that's being generated. Let's just talk about LLMs for, for, for a, a bit, because since they, that sort of started our journey, how do LLMs work? LLMs basically, again, ChatGPT being the most famous, it, they, they actually guess the next term in a sentence, which is kind of what that on the screen shows you. The students opened their blank. So what they do is they take a get best guess at what that next word should be knowing. And again, it's known what that next word is. And they guess what that next word is. Is it books? If they get it wrong, the model is true. That's how the model is trained, you know. So and, and again, it's, it's a conceptually difficult thing to understand. But at the heart of it, the LLMs are trained on guessing the next word. So when you take that all together, what that actually means is on massive amounts of, of text, they'll, they'll, they'll guess the next word, they'll get it wrong, they'll be told that's wrong, try it again, they'll try it again, try it again, until they get it right, and then they move on. I think that the best analogy for this is, imagine someone that's standing in front of a, has got a bow and arrow, and they're, they're trying to hit the bullseye. And they fire the arrow, and the arrow misses. Their trainer is sitting behind them, uh, their coach. And the coach says, bit to the left, down, down a small bit. And the person tries again, corrects, tries again, doesn't hit the bullseye. Yep, you're a little bit high to, still, but you've gone too far left, go right again. That's kind of the journey that LL, they go through with LLMs. It's, it's taught to correct, 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 correct until you get it right, and then they move on to the next one. So that's so you might scratch your head and think, oh, that that's how, how does how does ChatGPT come out with stuff based on guessing? Well, there's a much bigger story there because what ChatGPT and these other LLMs are doing is they're beginning to understand context. They're bit not, it's not just learning the words; it's actually understanding context and the meaning of things, and that's why they're so clever. And again, the dynamic you have to ask a computer scientist exactly how all that works, and it, it does make your head fall off a little bit when you dive deep, but. That's the basics of how LLMs work. That's the basics of how they learn. And the contextual thing and the understanding thing is why they're so incredibly clever based on this enormous amount of data that they've been trained on over a long, long period of time. So that's LLMs. So I wanted to make sure that folks understood that everything is not generative AI we are living in a world of machine learning and, and some of the work that we do within my group is to understand how do you best apply artificial intelligence, machine learning to your world as a business. And I put on the screen there, and this was generated by Claude, which is another LLM, I mentioned it. What are the sort of things that you can do just with pure machine learning? Forget generative AI for the minute, just with pure machine learning. And you'll see a lot of the words prediction and forecasting there. So a lot of times we can now actually use these things to do this kind of what if scenarios. So we've got weather, we've got financial forecasting, sales demand forecasting, predictive maintenance, disease prediction in the health world, traffic and transportation prediction, fraud and recommendation systems. So there is a world out there that is the machine learning world, which is potentially applicable to your businesses. You'll pick up on all sorts of tools now that have got AI embedded in within them. 
And again, it's not necessarily generative AI, but it does some of these predictive things. I'll give you an example of some work that I've been doing with a group outside of my main sort of role within generative AI. We've been looking at um, <clears throat> convective storms. Now, in the insurance world, and convective storms are a very big deal because they're very fast moving and they're quick and they're very damaging. So we had years ago, I remember living in the avenues and we had a tornado that hit downtown. Somebody was killed, actually. It ripped through the avenues and caused a massive amount of damage. Weather forecast didn't forecast it. It was a very quick moving event. One of the things that we've been working on as a, again, as a separate machine learning project is can we predict that? Can we take real time data on what's happening at this very moment? know where the buildings are and in the insurance world it's obviously commercial buildings homes and vehicles etc can we actually take real-time data fuse that together with static data which is you know a home that's in a particular place use existing data train models against what happened in the past in other words what claims were there against these similar type of storms and then use machine learning to predict what's about to happen. So we've just picked up the fact that there's potentially a storm in Sandy, for example. Hasn't, there isn't a tornado, it hasn't touched down, but it's got the makings of that, so we'll watch it. As this thing starts to move, we're getting real-time data in that's telling us, yeah, you know, the, the conditions are right, the wind's there, the hail's there, um, there's a lot of water in that thing, that could turn into a tornado. So we can actually predict based on past events what potentially could happen if that touches down based on what those homes are in there. And that in the insurance world, that allows us to predict what the claims might be and how much that's actually going to cause them to have to pay out. So it's a kind of an example in my world of, of how machine learning can be used to make predictions on things that happen. And you've seen, you can see forecasts and predictions all over that. For your businesses, again, sales, sales de demand forecasting is potentially something that could be really important for you as you look ahead and you, you plan for the future. How can machine learning help you be better informed to make it, it decisions today that you uh, you know you, you couldn't have made in the past sometimes you've gone from sort of finger in the air stuff and it's sort of a gut feel to gut feel and some really quantitative stuff that may or may not be true but better to have something in place that gives you a sense of what potentially is going to happen than um than not so that's the first piece which is the machine learning piece and again, if anyone's got questions, please jump in. I'm, I'm more than happy to stop them and step back. Generative AI is not just about creating pictures and asking ChatGPT to, to you know, write an article for you. There's a lot of things that fit, fit under generative AI. I've just listed eight there. There's many, many more. <clears throat> again, I want to give you a sense. We'll, we'll be talking about content in a minute, specifically content. But I think there's a very much a focus within generative AI is on content and not so much on the other things that can be done. And, and the world is, I said at the start, you know, I don't really, we don't really know where this is going, not just with machine learning, but with generative AI, AI as well, because the, 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 the sphere is so wide. But if I walk through this, you know, ideation, market research, content generation, customer support with, with chatbots, personalized marketing, automated reporting, product design, sales forecasting, on and on and on. There, there's so many things you can do with it. So the sky's the limit. Um, and again, this was generated with Morphic, which is an open source LLM, which is super cool. I, I would encourage you to try it. I think it's morphic.sh is the, uh, the URL, but it's a, it's a really nice tool. I love it. So I ideated with Morphic asking it this question, and this is what it came up with. I said, just give me like a list of eight key uses of generative AI today, and that's what it came out with. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things, personalized marketing, for, uh, sales forecasting, et cetera, but just understand I, I use generative AI a lot just for ideation. I just think through some things that some of the stuff I mentioned to you about um, the insurance use case for machine learning, me and the team, we ideated within generative AI to get some more ideas about that evolution of that product. And we validate it with, with, with potential customers, but that's the journey we've been on with this. So the, 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 the wide sphere of things that it could be used for uh, are massive. The sky's the limit. Quick sip of coffee, sorry. So third section, and, and by the way, this is, I think we've got an hour and a half for this presentation. I will not be going on for an hour and a half because you'll get super bored with me chatting away. It's more about what's on these slides and maybe re revisiting these slides. This next one is an important one. So what I tried to do here was I've been working and building things in generative AI for 
pretty much since ChatGPT came out. Um, so I built a compilation here of 14 of them, my favorite things that I've experimented with or done with for customers in that world. Most of this is not for customers, actually, because it's stuff I, stuff I can't share. But um, And if you want to look at this stuff, look, again, at the end, I'll mention it again. But in LinkedIn, I post all this stuff in LinkedIn, so worth following me on LinkedIn. But I'll press this and be quiet. It's about five minutes long, but this is going to walk you through lots of content that's been generated using lots of different tools within generative AI. So I get to shut up for a minute and you get to watch. introduces LiDAR technology, highlighting its applications, limitations, and benefits across various industries. It describes its impact in the AEC industry through several case studies. Articles such as these ones show that 3D laser scanning and LiDAR technology is used more and more in different markets and applications. Too late working on AI. I have a copy. GeoAI, an interesting term. It's geographic data meets AI, Sam. AI to predict geospatial patterns? Exactly, it's revolutionary and crucial for climate study. Just so you don't get confused, my name's Pete. Next to me is Zach. You can tell the difference between us. Zach has no clothing sense. He drinks weird yellow drinks, wears his sunglasses on his head, even indoors, and I am far better looking. Je continue donc mon voyage fascinant dans le monde de l'IA générative. Euh, J'ai récemment posté quelques vidéos sur la traduction. Je vais en essayer un nouveau aujourd'hui. Euh, un produit appelé Pip uh, Oppo Dot. A I, as you type. So let's go and do that. Imagine a tornado ripping through a city, sending, oops, I can't spell sending, sending debris flying in the air. Now, a couple of things I wanted to do. Let's go in and uh, let's just create a presentation. I'm going to do the first one is just generate with AI. So, as we often see in, in generative AI applications, it asks for a prompt. So, let's write in um, um, a presentation which um, discusses how to move from data silos, possible silos, to enterprise, gosh, my writing, my typing is terrible. Enterpr enter <laughs> enterprise data and analytics. Okay, let's generate the presentation. So it's gonna go through pull all information together and build out actually the story, which is really, really quite cool. So let's just watch this go. I may cut the video just to make speed this thing up, but let's just see what it does right now. Gathering data. See, this is going to be interesting, plotting the narrative, and it comes up with this. And that was pretty quick. So there is a presentation. So we've got an introductory slide. Let's walk through and see what we've got. Problem of data silos. Looks nice. Defining enterprise data and analytics. The benefits, look at that, they've got timelines. Very cool. 
strategies. Data governance, that's really interesting. Enterprise data analytics. Okay, so that's that. Um, so 14 examples of things that I've built historically um, using generative AI. And, and you can see the range of things there. I mean, I don't speak a word of French, but you heard me speaking in French. My voice lip synced to me. It was amazing to hear my, <laughs> I always wondered how it, what it would be like, what, how I would sound if I could speak French and, and you saw it there. You saw some humorous ones as well. I, I did that, the guys chatting to one another. I animated the voice of one of them or, or the face of one of them. So it's lip synced and I, it was obviously my voice, but I used a tool to, to do that work. Um, I wanted to include the, I, I really liked the, 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 the presentation, uh, the auto generated presentation from beautiful AI, um, really worth trying out. It was a really quite sophisticated deck that it came out with, with from a very simple prompt. And you saw the output, how beautiful the output was. So um, lots of different things there that I liked. Ebooks, you know, I generated an ebook which was modeled on, and again, we're touching now on the marketing world. There's a lot of stuff in there, I think, that is marketing. We'll talk about marketing in a minute. Um, but you can produce the most professional ebooks um, using these different tools. Um, so that was a, the one I showed there was a 22 page ebook that probably took me a day to build. Um, so, and it was modeled on um, some professional ones I'd looked at. So again, it's sort of, I'm not a graphic artist. Um, I, I'm a writer, I do a lot of writing. Um, I'm certainly not a video creator, but you could see there that I've been given, to, we've all been given tools now to do things that we could never have done before. So. Um, it's become a, I, I put at the top of that slide, creativity unleashed. And I, and again, we'll, we'll touch on that and I'll mention that at the end. We've now got these, we, we can now use our own creativity to create things that we couldn't have done before. Um, so it's less about learning the tools and making a, uh, making our best effort at doing something professional. We can do things very professionally quite quickly. It's then up to us to be creative in how we best do that. So creativity, for less about learning the tools and we can do things quite in a quite amazing way now so i'm just gonna move forward Oops. let's see if i can get this thing to go forward okay we're going to dive into marketing which is really at uh, i wanted to set the stage for marketing and i'm not spend, going to spend a, a ton of time on marketing but i think that the world of marketing and advertising is the first most obvious place to use um this uh, world of generative ai um, so again, not just about content, but about planning everything around marketing. So I've got another video. Um, a lot of people come to us and say, you know, we want a presence in LinkedIn. We want a better web page. We want uh, we want help with articles. So it's a really content centric conversation. But quite a lot of the time, we ask folks, um, tell us about your strategy. Tell us about what you're thinking. And there are some very fundamental things before you ever build content to understand. And having a, a clear strategy is something that's really important. And strategy is a really misunderstood term. Um, and there are folks that out, I mean, I've studied strategy for a long time. Um, there's a guy called Roger Martin, who um, is a very well known, he wrote a really a good, a, really a book I really enjoyed called Play, I think it's called Playing to Win. It's all about what an actual strategy is. So we've always start when we work with folks to talk about strategy. What is the strategy? Because we're not going to just empty, we're not going to real build content with, a, with, with an empty focus. We need to actually know what's the structure, what's the plan. So the first thing that we used, often use, in this case, ChatGPT4, is to generate automatically a strategy. And I'm going to play this video just for you to see what it is, and then I'll talk about it. So actually, I can probably talk through it. So this is ChatGPT. We've actually built a template which has got instructions which ChatGPT reads and then generates a strategy. So in this text box here, I said, please read the attached marketing strategy template and fill out for this particular web page, which is our web page. 
So what ChatGPT is doing here is actually generating that strategy completely. So we've got a business overview. We've got the value proposition. Target audience persona. So these are the building blocks of anything you do when it comes to, you know, marketing, but more broadly strategy for your business. Buyer personas, target markets. Who are we talking to? What are we talking to them about? Uh, and how are we talking to them? SWOT analysis. I don't know much about strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and I forget what the last one is, but this will do a SWOT analysis for you. Brand messaging and positioning. Marketing goals and objectives. Channels. Is it is it LinkedIn? Is it uh, is it Instagram? Is it blog posting? What what is it? Is it email campaigns? And then it's building up marketing strategy, digital marketing strategy, sales strategy. We included that in there. So I again, I emphasize the fact that. And particularly as a business, we want to have the foundation in place before we go any further. A lot of organizations struggle with building a strategy. Uh, and again, it can be overstated. And some people spend far too much time on it. Some people believe that a plan is a strategy. And again, Roger Martin done, done some videos on that. So go read those. But a real strategy is your, sort of your framework of operation. And if you haven't got one, you need to have one. ChatGPT can go a long way. And, and you could do the same with in Claude, can go a long way to help you build that strategy out. Now, is that the final piece? No, it's not. It's giving you a framework of operation. I mean, it's going to get things wrong. It's going to take guesses on things that you know better about. So having that foundational document, which is essentially what that would be, allows you then as a team to go in and start tweaking that and making it to tune into what you really want and what you know it is. And particularly when it comes to the content piece of that strategy, you'll notice content was one part of it. The content strategy was one part of it. That's where you build out that initial piece and then you start experimenting and, play and seeing what's working, what's, what's not working. So, again, I would emphasize the fact that having that foundation is a really important part of your marketing journey. If you haven't got it, you've got a wonderful tool now to help build that. And the template that we've built, again, if you reach back to me, if you want to know more about that, we use that when we work with customers just to help build that foundation. And sometimes they got a partial strategy and they haven't got, they've got pieces missing. This gives us gives all, all the pieces. So either we fill in gaps or we provide something complete. Oh, I almost trouble going forward. Okay, so this, I touched on this and, this, and, and the strategy piece actually really spoke about that. But what's the base of any st marketing strategy is really those three things. What story are you telling? In other words, what pain point are you solving? Who's the audience that's got the pain point? And then which channels do those can you reach those people on? So that's really where that foundational piece and that strategy is really, really important. Because anything you do within the world of marketing has to have those foundational pieces in place. And you have to make some very clear decisions or guesses around this. Guesses not being what the pain point is, your product or your solution, you should know what that pain point is. And that's what you're talking about. And you're weaving different stories around that pain point. Knowing, I don't know who anybody is watching this, but I have to guess that you're a small and medium sized businesses. So I tuned this presentation for you thinking that that's probably who you are. And maybe some people are students are listening and wondering about this stuff. So I've tuned this for the audience. Your messaging has to be tuned for the audience. And most of you may be yawning as I'm saying this, but some people, don't they try and throw things out there and hope it sticks? You've got to make sure that you build this stuff out. And then, yeah, the channels. When you make a decision about a channel, should it be LinkedIn? Should it be YouTube Shorts? Should it be, you know, what's that best channel for you? Sometimes you take a guess at that. Um, again, the using ChatGPT can help you sort of guide you as to what, what those most appropriate channels are. They may not work. So you're always tweaking the strategy. But these are the, the sort of core po pieces of that. Those strange d pictures on the right-hand side. <laughs> I asked, um, <clears throat> I asked Dali three, ChatGPT four, to produce for me essentially what I'm telling you here, and so that was the top picture that ChatGPT came up with. Um, <clears throat> and I asked the same thing of Midjourney, which is my favourite image generation tool, and that's what it came up with. Not really images that fit with what I'm trying to say. Um, but kind of cool looking images. Um, but this is, I, I believe, I forget what the next slide is, but I think this is going to lead us into 
Um, well, it will lead us into prompts at some point. Um, I want just to mention as you're thinking about the content you're generating, and again, for some of you, this is things you already know, but you've got to think about the buyer's journey. And again, I've generated a similar video. video for Ever this. wonder how buyers make decisions? Let me break it down for you. First, there's awareness where they engage with your brand. Then comes consideration, they start showing interest, becoming leads. Finally, decision time, they're ready to make a purchase. Remember, it's all about guiding them through these stages smoothly. Understanding the buyer's journey is key to successful sales. <clears throat> so the buyer's journey is important. Um, marketing, marketing experts are always thinking as they generate content about the buyer's journey. And in the bottom right-hand corner there, which is a bit too small, but... You'll see really the three stages of the buyer's journey, the awareness stage, the consideration stage, I'm looking up, and the decision stage. So it's engagement, leads, and sales. So all the content you're generating with <clears throat> being helped with generative AI, <clears throat> you've got to always be thinking about those pieces. One of the places, so for example, where does an ebook fit? An ebook probably fits in the middle tier, the consideration phase. Um, <clears throat> where does a white paper fit? Now, buyers are probably getting to that point where they're thinking about buying, Maybe a white paper is a good place to push them over the edge. It's at the top stage that people struggle the most. And I'll tell you that um, I spend a lot of time in LinkedIn. Uh, and LinkedIn is a great business, the B2B world. I'm, I'm less involved in the, in the um, B2C world, which is sort of the Instagrams, the TikToks of this world. I'm not so engaged there. But I can talk to LinkedIn. Um, compelling content in there is critical. I, I see a lot of people making mistakes in LinkedIn either blatantly selling there or pretty much producing stuff that's you're not you're not interested in it and, and I think you've got to be aware of the fact that people are scrolling through social media quickly how do you get their attention really quickly social media I mean generative AI gives you the opportunity and you saw some of that in those 14 slides that I shared with you of producing really compelling content to grab people's attention and I think in today's world particularly in social media, particularly in a place like LinkedIn, where there's still good opportunities to get people's attention, the creative process comes in. So I mentioned the fact that you don't have to any longer kind of learn how to create images or pay graphic artists. You do have to pay graphic artists because they're super important, but you can do some of this stuff yourself, even if it's just initiating that to tell a graphic artist, I want that, make it a little bit better for me. You're empowered now to be able to do create compelling images, create animations. You saw an avatar there, a, a girl talking. That was completely generated as she wasn't a real person. It was just completely created by, um, by AI. So <clears throat> there's lots of clever ways now you can get people's attention. And I'll, I'll share with you a lot of this. I, I, because of the work I do, I, I spend a lot of time in that awareness phase. Can we get people's attention? And most of the posts I put out there get between 2,000 and 7,000 impressions in LinkedIn, which is, which is a lot. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot because a lot of people generally get 100. The biggest, the most successful post I ever put out got 160,000 impressions, which gets a lot of attention. So you know, 160,000 people effectively is what, who's looking at that. That doesn't mean you've won the game. It means that you could drive people through with clever calls to action within the text of that LinkedIn post to, to the middle of the funnel. But my point to you is there's a lot of clever ways now to get people in that awareness phase, to get people to know about who you are, to get people to want to know a little bit more about maybe your product or who you are or what you're doing. So a lot of clever ways to do it. Um, again, reach back to me if you want, if you've got more questions on that, because this is a place to spend a lot of time in. But uh, yeah, so... We'll move forward again. This is probably the, so this is really in the, in the, this is still in marketing, but I wanted to make sure that we covered this. So there's that building the strategy. There's that thinking about the content you're going to build and the different tools that are out there. There's thinking about the buyer's journey and where that content best fits that you're producing. And again, I think that the point I'll emphasize that you're empowered now to do a lot of this. It doesn't mean you can't use, external folks. I mean, people come to us to fill in gaps. People use marketing agencies to help them, but you're empowered to do a lot of this work now. I think the piece that a lot of people forget about is how do you measure the performance of your campaigns? I mean, marketing is often a sort of guesswork. And in each of those phases, you're guessing, does that call to action work? Is it powerful enough? Is it, does it stand out? You know, are the colors right? Is the wording right? 
Um, is the title of that blog post capturing people's attention? Is the image that's attached to that blog post or that article compelling enough to get people in? Um, so there's a lot of things one has to kind of measure, whatever that might be, the effectiveness of the email campaign. You can do all of that in using generative AI. So, you know, it, it's all good, well and good producing the content, throwing it out there, hoping that it works, maybe looking at, you know, um, Google Analytics and some other there are millions of tools to analyze it, but you can actually use these tools to help you understand that. And the diagram there is actually, if, if you ever come back and want to sort of pause this, um, that's actually taken from a, a paper, an, an AI paper, and it pulls in all the things we spoke about earlier. Um, I'm really only interested in the light blue piece of that. So you can feed your marketing performance data into um, one of these generative AI tools like ChatGPT, Claude, Morphic, et cetera. And you can actually train it to produce output like I've got on the right-hand side there. So, you know, there's a whole slew of different things that you can use it to tweak what you're doing. Content analysis, predictive analytics, A-B testing, customer segmentation, campaign optimization, personalization. There's a lot there. But all the time when you're doing marketing, you've got to make sure that are things working, are things not working. And just because you get 160,000 impressions from a post, and no one visits your website or nobody clicks to for an opt-in thing and gives you your email address. It doesn't mean that, that you, you've, the awareness is not working its way through to get to the final piece and the sales piece. So this is a great way to, to, to help you understand what's working and what not's working. And, and again, as you might need help with this stuff, but it's certainly not the complex world it used to be where you've got to buy all these expensive tools and bring in expertise. You can start this journey yourself in actually measuring your performance of, of um, the marketing that you do. So, and, and in this case, I use Morphic and Canva. Canva's like um, Photoshop online. It's super cheap and you can do, there's AI built into it. It's a really, it's a great tool. I, I really love Canva. So measuring effectiveness. So we enter the last section five. We get into the last, the final, final section of this, the last the hundred meters of the race. Um, I'm going to just talk about a few miscellaneous things here. Prompts, data, and resources are really the three things I'll cover here. Quick sip of coffee, sorry. I never drank coffee until I came to America. I always actually I didn't like tea. The Brits were always into bring, drinking tea. I, I hate tea. I used to go to my, my relatives' homes and they would uh, always offer me tea. And I was like, oh, please don't keep doing that. Anyway, tea's horrible, but I, I like people over here like tea. Okay, don't worry about what's happening on the right-hand side. Worry about the left-hand side for the minute. Prompts. If there's nothing that you take away from this, but you want to use generative AI, read up on prompts. Prompts are super, super, super important. Learning how to build effective prompts is crucial in generative AI. I'm reading this. Well-crafted prompts can significantly improve the performance, accuracy, usefulness, and outputs of generated, that's generated in this model. Let's look to the right. I'm using ChatGPT. I've given ChatGPT a picture of a ferret I got from Google Images. I've asked ChatGPT here, and I am asking it, describe the image. So this is a little tip for you, a little trick. What ChatGPT is doing there, it's looked at the image, and it's given me a description of what it's finding in that image. And that's a real picture of a real ferret. So what I do here is I copy that text. Then I plug it back into ChatGPT, and DALI 3 is what it's going to use to do the image. And I've asked, create an image which shows, and I've given it the text. Thinks about it. That's what it generated. That's, I, I, even I was blown away by that image that it came up with there. So that was actually a generated image from an image that by ChatGPT. Uh, so, hey, hey yeah. Matt. So I got a question for you. So, are, so is that within ChatGPT or with Dolly, or are those two set? That's uh, can you kind of explain the difference between those two? And I mean, yeah, are they yeah. connect, they're connected? It sounds like they're connected in some way. Is there an API between the two? Are you using one and the other? Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, thanks for the question, Bryce. And it's actually something I, I should have touched on earlier. So LLMs are text to text. So if, most of the time you're going to use ChatGPT in the way that I just described there. You know, there's an image, describe it for me. So it's text to text. The strategy piece was this text to text thing. Here's a document, read the document, it give me a text output. But what they've done with OpenAI, they, they built in a, a, an image generation model as well. So, 
So they have the two. They've got the LLM, which is a text piece, but they've also got this DALI 3, which is an image generator. So it's, it's all in one. The, a lot of the stuff that you've seen me point at in, you know, Mid Journey and Runway ML, I mean, all of the, thi all of the things I shared with you here, they're generally very focused applications that do, or sorry, generative AI solutions, which do particular things. Mid Journey is the best image generator. Runway is the best, I think, still the best video generator. But where we're moving to is this world that's called multimodal, which is by the end of this year, we'll be in a very much of a multimodal world. And that's really a multimodal solution, which is ChatGPT. So in other words, I can, I can work with images and text within one interface. I haven't got to go here for text, here for images, here for video, here for music. Uh, and by the way, there was a, I, I generated a, a heavy, that was a, that music in that, in that 14 piece examples. I hate heavy metal, but I asked, can you generate a heavy metal song about maps? And that's what it came out with. So, <laughs> but that was a very specific music generation tool. Where we're moving to is multimodal. So your question's a good one, Bryce. I should have touched on it. This is an example of multimodal. And I think when, I don't know what's going to happen with Sora because it hasn't yet been released by OpenAI, but I have a suspicion that you'll be asking in the same way as I'm asking about generate an image for me, I'll be asking within this same interface, create a video of this ferret running across the lawn and it will do the same thing. Where it's an interesting practical example of, of multimodal is in the medical industry. So think about how you, when you go to a doctor now, there are multiple piece, pieces of the puzzle. There's a guy that, you know, if you, if you go to a radiologist, they'll take a scan of you and there's that. You'll talk to one doctor about this, one doctor about that. There's images taken, there's videos taken. There's So diagnostics in, in medicine is multifaceted. What's going to happen in the medical world and what is happening is this multimodal world where you feed in to a generative AI model all of that data. And what it does is it goes, I know what's happening in this video. I can read this image and you've given me the text about the symptoms of the patient, and it's going to output something for a doctor. So it's going to be profound what's happening. And again, it's happening now. By the end of the year, we'll probably be close to that place. If not, um, you know, I, I suspect in the medical community, they're already doing it. Um, that world of, of the practical application of multimodal, I think the medical one's a great example of multiple inputs and multiple pension outputs. But we're still in this sort of single modal bimodal world which is what this prompt is here or, or what generative sorry chat gpt4 is and i mentioned chat gpt4 because that's a paid for that's a 20 dollars one a month um claude's got the same thing there's a 20 dollars model and they're the more advanced models they're the ones that have been tuned to work with more current data they're better so there's a free version of chat gpt which is 3.5 I, I like four. I, Twenty dollars a month is nothing, so I, I use four. This is this is using four. But thanks for asking the question, uh, Bryce, because it's a good one. Um, I, I'll just go back and emphasize: learn how to do good prompts. If you go to Journey, for example, which is the image generation tool, you can ask it to use. I mean, there's some really amazing things you can include in prompts, like use the Canon X Y Z as type of image output or, or the type of device I'd like you to produce the output from. You can ask these really profound, deep level questions of it. Um, uh, you could ask it, make this a sort of a cartoon like output versus a cinematic art output. Um, so the prompting is critical. And if you're going to get good output from any of this stuff, your prompts are going to be critical. So you'll go in and find sometimes that you struggle to, to, to do to get an output that you want. Like those images that I showed earlier that were the, they were poor, my prompts weren't very good. If I'd asked better prompts there and spent a bit more time in it, I'd have got a better output. Experimentation in prompts, reading about prompts, learning how to write prompts is, is number one. So I'd say if you want to do, get it right, spend some time on prompts. The other thing you could look at is training your own model. So I mentioned earlier on, it's kind of why I went into a bit of depth about the training piece of this. Um, you know, ChatGPT has been trained on all the data on the internet. Um, but you can train your own models. So you can actually take your own data and train it against your data. Um, so there's a couple of examples on the screen. The animated GIF on the left there is Runway ML. It's, it actually says in the interface, train your own model to generate images uh, that you want. Um, there's another piece in the ChatGPT world, which is called GPTs. And that's the interface for it on the right there. 
people have been building their own specific focused GPTs for a while now. So there's a whole store of stuff out there. Uh, you can think of it as like the app store of things that have, 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 have been trained to do this. So that website generator is someone who's built their own GPT, their own version of ChatGPT. It sits on top of ChatGPT. It's very, it's trained to do specific things. What might that look like in your world? Um, one of the questions that's come up in the work that I've been doing is, RFPs are a big deal, you know, um, response for proposals, you know, and, and they're, I mean, big public agents, for example, which I've worked with for most of my career, they've released these very long, complicated re re proposals for small, medium and large businesses to send proposals out and, you know, say, well, we can, we can do that. And I, again, those that know RFPs, which is probably most of you know exactly what I'm talking about here. But a question came up the other day was, can we train a, a, a GPT or a, a, a Gen AI model to input, to take successful, successfully won RFPs, because they're published, you know, particularly in, a, in the public sector. Can I, can I train it against these successful RFPs when the next one comes out, which is a new RFP, can I give it to... Chat GPT, just like I did with the strategy, and say, can you help me write a winning RFP based on the fact that you know these ones over here won? So that's you kind of training a GPT or your own model on data that you've got uh, that you want done. So can that be done? Absolutely. Are people doing that now? More than likely. But Imagine what you, again, I think internally uh, organizations have asked me about like le legal profession. You know, we don't want this out in the public sector, in the public world. We want to work with our own customer data or our own data, um, client data. Can we do that internally? And there's ways to do that. There's, there's, there's lots of ways to actually train these models on your data um, to do the things that you want. So, it's a bit more sophisticated. I, I only put this up because I encourage folks to, to look at this stuff. GPTs are really interesting. There's really interesting ones out there. You want to build a website. Well, there's a website generator there. Those guys will help you do that. But you can build your own as well. So you want to train your own models with your own data to get a particular output. You can do it yourself. So it gets a bit more clever, but uh, that's the world that we're moving towards. And I think these generic models where we can ask these particular questions are fantastic. But you can also train the stuff, tune it to your own data that's only for you. Or you can build businesses of like the guys who are the website generator. They're probably charging to do that. I don't know. But there's businesses being built where people train the models to do their own thing. So the sky's the limit is where I'm, so I'm going with it. The sky's the limit. I encourage you just to take a look at this stuff and know you can train your own stuff if you want. Or we can help you train your own stuff if you're really interested. Um, we're close to the end. Three resources. Matt Wolf is brilliant. He's on YouTube. He's got probably 600,000 followers. He's only been doing it for a year. You want to stay up to date with what's happening in the world of, of, of uh, generative AI. Matt Wolf is well worth following. He does every Thursday. He just generates what's out there, what's new, updates on news. So he's really, he's really good. The Curious Refuge guys, are, I, I love them. They're, they're actually in the world of, of movie generation, or, or at least in the the movie world. So, you know, we, we're getting to a point where people are now generating movies, short, short movies with generative AI. That's kind of their worlds, but they talk a lot about what's new, what's coming. They're very creative. You'll learn a lot about the different tools that are out there. I mean, the last one I watched was about what Adobe are doing and, you know, Adobe doing on our, being on our doorstep, what they're integrating into their existing tools. Talk a lot about advances in mid journey and, uh, and new tools that are coming up. So I pick up a lot from Matt Wolf and from the Curious Refuge guys. Um, encourage you to follow them and listen to what they're doing. They're very much on the creative side of things, but they give you a really good sense about what's what's coming and what's new and how things are changing. Of course, you can follow me as well on LinkedIn, and I I post like I said a lot of the stuff that I gener have generated and shared here. I posted there. You'll see me talk about the world as well of, of AI. Uh, and uh, so you, know, you follow me there. I can't think what the last slide is. So I, I, this is this is the last slide. So drum roll. Um, think of machine learning and generative AI as the expert in the room who gives you new superpowers. I mean, that's really what you have to think of it in terms of. If you if I break this down in the simplest of ways, that's kind of what it is. 
and it, and don't don't get too locked locked onto generative AI. Remember, it's machine learning, and it, generative AI is part of machine learning. Machine learning can help you do lots of predictive things within your businesses, all sorts of incredibly clever automating tasks, etc. I've shared with you that uh, generative AI is a content generator and a lot more. Sky's the limit. New tools coming out continuously. You know, it's hard to keep up with, but it's it's changing our world. The prompt, you can guess the prompt. That was generated in mid-journey, but I, I basically asked, show a business owner um, with uh, a group of, of uh, Marvel characters as helpers. And so that's that image. And that's kind of, if, if you take nothing away from this, think about you as that guy looking at that computer with a whole load of helpers behind you uh, who have got lots of different skills. That's generative AI. And that's my kind of summary of the talk. And uh, I, I like that picture as well. So, uh, And that's it. You can, I, like I said, I work for generative AI marketers. We do a lot of assessment of organizations. If you're trying to understand how AI and machine learning can help within your organization more broadly, we do assessments. We can really give you a sense of where it might help. Looking at your business currently, where which, which, where we it, it might slide in to help you do certain parts of the business, whether it be predictions or analytics, or whatever it might be. So the broader machine learning place but we also do marketing as well, which is obviously that's in the name. So if you need help with building a marketing strategy, if you've got gaps in your marketing strategy, if you just want to know how to get started and help have us help you generate content for your marketing, then we do that as well. So that's my email address. That's my phone number. And that's it. All right, guys. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Matt, for being with us today. You guys have any questions? This is a great time to ask some questions. Uh, really, really cool. Uh, I mean, there were so many, uh, so many different tools that you covered there, Matt. Uh, well, um, what, one question is: so, how many, how many different uh, apps, AI apps, did you use, or did you show that you're using right now, or have you used recently? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, what I like, the way I try to build this was to show you the use of each of the tools. So, I, there's probably. I would guess 15 or more tools in there. I've got particular favorites. Um, as I mentioned, I, 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 you, you saw me using ChatGPT. ChatGPT and Claude are different LLMs. Just, just think about the tech side of it, and you'll notice slightly different outputs from both of them. So I, I like to, like if I'm writing an article and I want an idea, I'll go to both of those guys and ask them questions, and they give slightly different output. I'll, I'll also feed my final article into the, them both and say, you know, critique that. What, what have I got right? What have I got wrong? What do you think about it? Just as a guide, SEO is a big deal still. You know, is the SEO right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get Google to find me against, you know, generative AI marketing. Have I embedded those long tail short words in there? So I use those two a lot in, in, the, in sort of the world of um, LLMs. Midjourney is still the best image generator. Um, Runway ML is still the best video generator. And I'm quoting Matt Wolf and the other guys. that they're, they're the ones doing a lot of that work. But there's a lot of others catching up. So they're the four that I probably use the most. But what's becoming interesting is that there's um, – I mentioned Beautiful AI. I mean, I, I'd encourage you to try Beautiful AI. I, I didn't generate this presentation from Beautiful AI, but I could have done. Um, so I, I really like their output. And if you're trying to generate a very professional presentation – it's a really good starting point because they not only you give them a prompt and it builds the slides out and it understands what you're trying to do. I mean, it really blew me away when I when I did that. One of the slides that you saw there in the 14 piece, it was towards the end. Was I? I think presentations are too often we see really dry presentations. I hope this wasn't a dry presentation for folks, but um, too many words and you know you don't really get the gist of the story. It's sort of you know, those fundamental pieces, people focus on like the features and the features of their solutions and it's like boring. Tell, how do I tell the story in a much more compelling way where people understand it? So there was a there was one video there which showed three grain silos sinking. I don't know if anyone can remember that. Go back and look at it. And then this like this cloud of data essentially is what it's meant to be rising up. So these silos are sinking and the clouds coming up. One of the organizations I'm working with is the, the world of data silos is a big deal in big enterprises. I mean, government, you know, DOTs, you, the, DOTs are and an other big public entities. You've got data in this department, data in this department. What we've been working on is trying to break down those silos 
So the data and the and the information that you get from the data is across the organization instead of isolated in each one. And I was thinking, how can you best kind of visualize that without the words, you know, just show it in a video. And that video is like eight seconds long. But basically it starts with showing three silos with, with data streaming off the bottom of them like a firework, like a rocket. And then the, as it as it goes through, the, the, the data comes together and starts to cloud up and this, the silos sink. To me, that is a very, and guys, the guys we're working with loved it. You know, it's a very powerful way to present the story you're about to tell. You know, that's the story. And you don't need words to show that. So that was a combination of, of using mid-journey to create the, I, I followed the same process as the ferret. I, I asked, I, I took a picture off of it, Google Images, I asked Claude or, or ChatGPT to describe it. I put it into mid-journey. I kept tweaking the, the prompt until I got it right. And then I put it into um, a Runway ML. And in Runway ML is interesting. You can ask Runway ML just to create a video for you, or you can actually paint. And again, you'll have to try this out. You can paint parts of the image to animate them. So what I did was I painted the three silos and made them fall and then i painted the data and made it rise like a cloud so i went through a series of tools there to get to that end point but i thought that's a very powerful way to tell a story and i think for the guys watching this you know it's all about getting people's attention and telling things in a very compelling way to get to get their attention that first phase of the fun you get your attention in a presentation that's the kind of thing that's very powerful and i'm no graphic artist nor am i an animator i use my imagination and sort of creativity in my brain. I'm more of a storyteller than anything else um, to do that. And so, you know, some of those tools that can allow you to do that. And every day there's new tools coming out. So in this, all of my favorite tools are there. And I mentioned the four of the five that I use the most, but I'd encourage people to go back and look through the names that are in there. Cause there's quite a few other ones there, try them out and see how they work and see what they can do. And if you need your hand, you know, if you need some guidance on what it is, how to use them, how we use and you know we've been doing it for a long time now so feel free to reach back but it's a good question bryce and hopefully everyone leaves us and just starts playing around with this stuff because i swear it's you you get addicted to it you can go oh my gosh i did not realize i could do that it's just it's really addictive but from a business perspective you've got to separate what's useful to you as a business i mean you can get you know play with it until the cows come home but what's the most effective tools for your business where are you trying to get to and what are the ones going to help you do the things you want to do those are the critical things. And I try and focus my attention on the business uses of it rather than getting too wild about the all the new things that are coming out. Because, you know, in a practical sense, you're trying to you're trying to grow your business, you're trying to increase revenues if you're a small or medium sized business. How can these tools help you? That's kind of my always been my focus. So I long right. asked your question, Bryce. Yeah, so Matt, that's great. Thank you so much. We have a question online here. So do you credit so this is a question from Suzanne. Uh, do you credit the AI tool you use to create videos or photos when you post to online? Uh, for instance, if I use an AI tool to create a short video for my business, do I need to credit that tool on my website? Are there legal issues that you know of if, if, if we don't? Mm. That's a really good question. I don't. Um, the big question that comes up is, let's talk about music, and people may have heard about this one. If I say to one of the music generators, create a song which is about maps, which is based around the Beatles, and it produces a melody and a song which is a Beatles song, there are questions around that long term legally. Um, so I think we're in a bit of a gray area when it comes to create. I, I, I never, I never reference or give credit to the tool that's using it, but the content that's been trained on is the question. So that ferret that I produced, you know, it was somebody else's image and I used that as a, a recreation. So I, from a copyright perspective, I don't think it's copyright to the image because it came out of that tool. But if you're asking it to, you know, write me a short story that's based on also, um, H.G. Wells and it's in the style of H.G. Wells and it feels H.G. Wells-ish, that's where I think long term it's going to be problematic and the industry has got to kind of figure that one out. So I think at the moment we're in that, the early stage of the internet where it's sort of the wild west a little bit, but I, I'm very careful about the content I generate. And if I, I never ask it to be something specifically related to somebody else's work, because 
I think long term that could be highly problematic. So I try and say extremely genetic, gen generic. But I, to answer Susan's question, I, I don't generally reference the, the tool that was used in this MR So I'll put it out there, and you know, I presume it's ours. If we've come out, if I've gone through a process of generating a prompt in ChatGPT, then an image, multiple prompts and images, and then you know, animating that. It's, at the end of the day, it's me doing all that work even though the sources that are doing the pieces are different. So that's kind of how I, but that's going to change. I don't know how that, what, what the, looking into the crystal ball, I don't know what the future looks like for that. So I would say be cautious. Matt, another question we have here is uh, uh, from Novatech Digital. Uh, would, would AI take over the digital marketing space, especially in running ad campaigns, meaning to just kind of, you just, from my understanding of the, the nature of the question, I don't have a name, just Novatech, uh, just letting, uh, you know, for digital marketing campaigns, it's going to run it for you. Tell maybe tell prompts and whatever, and it's just going to kind of run, run as this, if it's if it's your ad campaign manager. I think it's a good question. I, I don't, I can't fully answer the question because it isn't one isn't able to answer it yet. I, I, I always use the analogy of a pilot in an aeroplane. You know, I got a good friend who's a captain of a you know in a Delta, and I say to him, you know, you've got computers in that aeroplane that can take. It can do everything, you know, you don't have to do anything. It can land it, it can take it off, it can do everything. So what's the purpose of you? And he said, well, I'm, I'm kind of the overseer of the aeroplane. You know, I, I if we have a problem, I jump in. If we don't, you know, so it's really a question of is, are humans replaced by machines? And, and no, they won't be. We're never going to have not have a captain in an aeroplane. Self-flying aeroplane is never going to happen. You know, there's a question. I mean, self-driving cars are different for a conversation. I, I think there's always going to be a human in the room when it comes to AI. I, I suspect, you know, really AI means automation. How far one goes down that path of automation, I don't know. But, you know, there's that long conversation about are people going to lose their jobs? No, I don't think. I mean, AI can produce, machine, well, generative AI can produce Python. You know, you can produce Python. I produce Python code. But, but does that mean programmers lose their Python developers are gone? No. It just means you've got that starting point. You haven't got to do the drudgery bits of it. But you've always got to have it what's going to happen in the future of work is anyone that's a marketing person, if they don't know how to use AI, then they will lose their job. Programmers, if they don't know how to use AI, they're going to lose their jobs and on and on and on. But you're not going to be replaced. So the question of the campaigns, I don't know. I have a suspicion they're going to be much more automated than they are today. Does that take people out of the loop? No. I think people are still going to be there. Maybe it means we, we're we more precise in how we best personalize and target and segment and measure and all those things but humans are always going to be in the loop so i don't think we're going to be replaced i don't think those campaigns are going to be replaced i would say that why i started the why i called it what i called it was it levels a playing ground for small and medium-sized businesses today you've got to spend a bucket load of money trying to do all this stuff now you're still gonna to have to pay the googles for putting those ads out there on linkedin but the bill what you put out there and what you measure and what you do you're like the big boys now. You haven't got to spend that money anymore. So it does level the playing ground, the automation piece, and allows you to do stuff that you could never have done historically. So it's a bit of a nuanced answer, that one. And Matt, and you're kind of talking about what levels the playing field in the creative process, the creative, we're making the creative. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I think in, in everything, if you're thinking about yeah. doing an email campaign, you know, AI can help you be more effective in that, e in that email campaign. I mean, there's a lot of expensive tools out there that help you do that, but you haven't necessarily got to do that. How do you word it? How did it perform? Um, uh, what do you include in it? I mean, you can use AI to ask all these questions. I mean, today, I think a lot of small and medium sized businesses kind of struggle. They don't even know where to begin. I mean, marketing is a bit of a complicated thing that's, it's not, it's as much science as it is art, you know, but you can be, you can use um, AI to help you in all those parts of the, of the journey. So I think that you haven't got to spend the same money and you've got a better understanding because you've got this helper sitting next to you to help you do it more effectively than you could have in the past. So I think it's an opportunity for small businesses to actually do, to actually approach particularly marketing in a much more effective way, whether it be organic or whether it be, you know, paid for. Great. This, this is great, Matt. This is, this has been great. Uh, any other questions? We've got plenty of people on the online here. So feel free to type in the questions here on the, the chat box. Uh, or even in the Q&A, but uh, either way, or just unmute yourself or ask me unmuted and uh, go ahead and ask your question if you have one for Matt. 
people are shy or overwhelmed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you presented it very well just to get get to kind of the background and understanding. I think, uh, you know, it really made it easy to understand what AI is, you know, uh, it's great, great, great work defining it and helping us understand it. Um, like it was, I think it's, it's a great presentation. <clears throat> so as we're waiting for a question, um, I'm just going to stop sharing. I'm going to share my screen for a second. What I want to show is just uh, so you guys know, just as we, if you have a question, just feel free to uh, jump in. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Uh, and just uh, as we have uh, the next events coming up on tap, Uh, for us. I think you can see that there. Yep. Uh, next week, pay the IRS less without going to jail with Merrill Taylor, May 7th, 9 to 11 a.m. So like, it's really essentially a tax deduction workshop. Uh, there's nothing illegal going on there that we're teaching people to do. Um, although when we first posted and, changed, and created this name of the event, we had the some a local IRS um, kind of group that we, we worked with past. They were kind of a little little worried you know we're we're doing something un underhanded but no it's a tax deduction everything's legal this is how you can lower your tax uh, uh exposure legally and so we do the uh, kind of co cover those things with uh pay the irs less without going to jail so it's a great event coming up next tuesday at nine and the following week we uh, follow up with another uh session on ai so another a different angle another angle from someone who's working uh in in AI in a different way. And I think it's just, it's just wonderful that we have so many people, uh, you know, uh, you know, particularly in Utah, you know, we're, we're early adopters in a lot of ways uh, in technology. Um, so this is great. Um, just another great conversation. So that's May 14th, nine to 10 30 uh, with D Doug Brockbank. All right. What are the questions do we have for, uh, for Matt here? So if we don't have any other questions, I'm just going to double check the chat box. Okay, here's a here's a question. Uh, this is from uh, Bear Bangs. Uh, what has been your favorite tool to teach how to write effective prompts? Oh, that's a good question. I, I honestly go on trial and error. Uh, the 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 thing that I, I the first sort of tip that I I recognized was asking ChatGPT about something or Claude, like I showed you guys actually, is, is to help that um, help that process of starting the prompt. But I've done a lot of trial and error. There must be good tools out there to help with, with prompts. I, I really haven't used any. I've done mostly just watching other people and what they're producing. Um, it, it's interesting that some of these guys, I'm trying to think, I think it's mid-journey. They use Discord, which is a so you go to Discord again. The folks that don't know Discord, go go and try it out. Um, you'll go to Midjourney. They got a funky website, and then you'll sign up and go to Discord. You can actually see other people's prompts in Discord. So it's kind of interesting. There's this sort of public place where you can type in your slash. I think it's slash imagine, and then you type in a prompt and you do your thing. But you can look at other people's, and I, I've learned a lot by looking at other people's prompts. And so you can actually watch their, see them put in a prompt. It's like this public, you know, so it's public interface. And then you can watch the output and, and it's astounding what people come out with. So I, I generally looked at what other people have done, picked up tips and tricks from other people, but there must be some good sites. I just, I've never used one myself. I've just kind of dived in and played around and seen what worked for me. So I, I can't give you a great answer, but looking at what other people are doing is my best advice. Yeah. Great question, Bear. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? We've got just a couple more minutes here. We have up until 1030, or if we don't have any questions, then I guess in the next minute, we'll, we'll go ahead and close out early. Okay, here's one, uh, uh, Trina from Trina. Thank you. What What is your take on AI college degrees? So there's AI college Ooh. degrees. Now, can you, can you clarify, do you mean, uh, what do you mean by that? Is, is you can get a bachelor's in science as an AI? Or what, is, what do you exactly mean on that? Using AI, okay, 50 plus master's degree programs in AI. So that would Ooh. be learning how to code and do work with machine learning or just using AI. I guess that's there's maybe a clarification on that, yeah. how those work. 
Well, I mean, I, I could generalize. I did go to the U and did a. I was spent some time in computer science. Um, if you're if you're a computer scientist, everything was kind of, everyone's leaning towards AI. So there's a huge demand now for people that are technically skilled to write all this stuff. There's a huge demand for prompt engineers as well, which is interesting. So on the technical side, that's probably where the biggest demand for that is. And the U, and we, we got some fantastic universities here, BYU, the U, um, you know, amazing programs there. I, I don't know more broadly than that. But so if you're very technically savvy and you're, you're a tech person, that's a great path to go down because the demand is just off the charts. My focus obviously is how you use this stuff. So I, I understand the technology and I was a developer but I also, I, I'm really looking at the applications of it. And I think that that's a growing area where people are trying to help, like this talk actually is, how do we use this stuff? How, how do we best, most effectively use it? It's all right knowing that there's a tool that's like a hammer. You know, a lot of, I like those videos I described to you, they talk about the hammers that are out there, but then my interest is, so what, do I, what can I do with the hammer? I can build a house, I can build a cabinet, you know, it's how you use the tools to be most effective. That's my world. And I think that there's a, an increase in demand for people who are sort of evangelists like myself and people who can kind of translate the technology. So it's a whole new world. It's evolving on the technical side, massive demand on the side that I live on increasing demand. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's like the early days of the internet. We're not still not quite sure where this thing's going to go to lots of stuff's coming out. People are very confused, but the opportunities to work within the field and to, to use what is generative AI and, and machine learning and AI is just unimaginable. So it's a magic time to be alive, I think. <laughs> How's that? that Maybe a good uh, end part to my conversation. It's a great time to be alive. Well, there's so much good that can be done with uh, with AI for sure, right? Um, so, uh, to, it's, you know, it's like anything, it's a tool. Um, so great things can happen through it and make life really good for a lot of folks uh, used right and so it's good for all of us to dive in uh, in some level to learn how to use it, the prompts, and really to see and test different tools. And and uh, there's different language models out there, different, uh, um, you know, just it's, I think it's fascinating. So great, great opportunity, certainly to be alive. So um, with with that said, guys, I think we're almost at time. I uh, we'll really appreciate um a uh, real one last question before I let you go. I think we have a couple more minutes here. Just if you can do you talk to this, is there an AI tool to build websites? Well, I showed one actually when we were when we were talking about um, the GPTs. So go and look at those GPTs. Go to Chat GPT, and then there's an option that said it's like an app store of GPTs. Oh, okay. Those guys have built one. But honestly, um, if if you use um, WordPress, building websites now is is cake. Um, and, and I think that you, so to build it yourself is easy. To actually have generative AI look at your website and critique it is something that we do a lot. I mean, actually, that tool I showed you, the strategy tool, we presume or we hope that you've got a good website that describes your value proposition, all those things, because it's built against that. But if you've got a badly worded website that isn't SEO enabled, that doesn't, you know, da 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 da, then yeah. So there's, there are tools in that world and go to GPTs. But to build it on WordPress with a blog underneath it, really important thing to know. Build WordPress is the best one. And it's got a blog underneath it. Why is a blog so important? Because when people do Google searches, they're going to find your articles and come to your website. So really important. The LLMs and generative AI can help critique your website, help you write the content, help you SEO it. So you can do it yourself or you can use the generators. They're both there for you. Awesome. Great. Well, great question. Thanks, Tanner, for that question. Again, thank you so much for being with us, everybody. Uh, this has been a great opportunity. And uh, Matt, just a wealth of information. Thank you so much for being with us and taking your time. And, uh, you know, you've done, you've gone through so many things and the expertise you've done. You, and, and I know we're, a lot of us here are learning, some of us on 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 the call are, are experienced as well in AI. So just a, a great, another great perspective. And we really appreciate you being with us. And we Hope to, to see you again soon. Everybody, thanks. Uh, again, we'd love to see you next week at Pay the Iris Less Without Going to Jail and then the following week with the next uh, session for AI with another perspective as well. So with that, we'll, we'll bid you adieu. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.